Hey everybody, welcome to the green room of Disrupt TV. We're not burning here, but hopefully everyone's air quality is getting better. But hey, we're gonna do some quick introductions. Before we begin, we've got our awesome producer, Elle, as you can see, and my amazing co-host and co-founder, Bala Afshar. So let's go in reverse order of when we're gonna show up here on the show. So Adam, where are you coming in from and what are we talking about today? Calling in from New York City, and uh, my next book is called The Leap to Leader, How Ambitious Managers Make the Jump to Leadership. It's really about the mindset shift you need to make when you become a leader. Very, very cool. Hey, thank you. Anastasia, where are you coming in from today, and what are we going to talk about? Oh, hi, thank you for having me. I am also in New York City today. We're going to talk about leadership in a different sense, in a specific sense, in climate, uh, regenerative agriculture, climate decarbonization. Very, very cool. We're super excited to hear. Alex, where are you coming in from and what are we talking about today as well? So I'm coming from Connecticut, 45 minutes outside of New York, and we're going to talk about cybersecurity and uh, what boards need to know about cybersecurity. Wow. Well, hey, with that, we're going to kick things off soon. Back to you, Elle. Ready for the count. All right. Three, two, one. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, our distinguished guests, your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host, Ray Wong. He's the CEO, founder of Constellation Research. He is the best-selling author of Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Ray's a regular television, business, and technology news contributor on Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, Bloomberg, and CNBC. In my humble opinion, he's one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to the Shark TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm here with my awesome co-host, Vala Afshar. And as everybody knows, Vala is the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce. He's also the author of The Pursuit of Social Business Excellence and his new book, Boundless, a new mindset for unlimited business success will be available this September. But executives around the world pay attention to every one of his inspirational, insightful tweets. And when he's not hosting, keynoting, or leading events at Salesforce, you can find him speaking out on business outlets, at keynotes around the world, and more importantly, on places like Bloomberg and posting insightful analyses on ZDNet, especially of this show. So thanks a lot. And so, of course, who is kicking off our show and more importantly it's not about us it's about our amazing guests so what do we have and who do we have to begin we're covering a topic that's on top of every cxo and board and it's cybersecurity. so we have with us dr alex jampolsky ceo of security scorecard alex is co-founder chief executive officer of security scorecard a globally recognized cybersecurity innovator leader and expert security scorecard is now one of the world's most trusted cybersecurity brands with tens of thousands of customers, including half of the Fortune 100 and nine of the top 10 US banks with employees over 600, uh, with, with over 600 employees. The company has earned the Gartner Peer Insights Customer's Choice Award and has been named a leader in the Forrester New Wave. Alex was named Ernest Young Entrepreneur of the Year and Cyber Defense Magazine CEO of the Year. Alex has served as Chief Technology Officer CISO and led security teams at small companies like, you know, Goldman Sachs and Oracle. <laughs> Alex has published numerous articles, won the Public Key Corrupt 
Cryptography Conference Test of Time Award for his verifiable random function invention, which he holds numerous patents, and published books, uh, a book with uh, titled The Perfect Scorecard, Getting an A in Cybersecurity from Your Board of Directors. You can follow, uh, you can follow Alex on Twitter at AYA. M-P-O-L-S-K-I-Y. Welcome, Alex, to Disrupt TV. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Vala. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, sir. We're super excited to have you for multiple reasons. Cybersecurity has been one of the top topics in the boardroom, in the executive suite for quite some time. As we improve and, and increase our ability to get into digitization, it keeps coming, right? And every organization is at risk. Now, as you know, there's a lot of buzz around the SEC proposing new rules on cybersecurity risk, but more importantly, how do companies report on it or even get an assessment of what's going on? Give us the latest as what should CEOs and boards be thinking of and more importantly, be aware of? Sure. Well, cybersecurity could be a material risk. If a company gets hacked, it could affect the stock price. It could affect investor confidence. So that's why SEC is thinking about how to incorporate cybersecurity regulations into its guidelines. And, you know, it's still being finalized, but uh, the discussions that companies are going to be required to include board directors, cybersecurity experiences and resumes uh, in their public disclosures, in the forms that they file. They're going to have to disclose their uh, cybersecurity risk oversight practices, and uh, they will have to disclose within uh, four days information on any type of cyber incidents that could affect- Four days? Disclose to whom? Wow. Very fast, much faster than ever before. And so I think that's going to be a wake-up call to a lot of boards. Do we have a board member with a cyber expertise? Do we have the proper infrastructure and methodology to be able to fulfill those type of requirements. So I think this attention is going to raise the bar significantly. I see a chessboard behind you. Uh, I was going to ask you for your ELO rating. You, you play, you, you're an avid player? <laughs> so I used to compete. I used to compete back in college. Uh, so I play, uh, you know, I play in the 99th percentile. So uh, wow. I play probably at about a 2300 level. So wow. on, a, on a warm summer day, if you go by <laughs> Union Square Park, you can probably find me hustling some people over there. <laughs> <laughs> With that rating, you're definitely hustling people. That, you, oh may be God, the, yeah. you may be the top chess player we've had with the thousand interviews we've done on the show. That's right. Uh, I might not give you good advice on security, but at least I'll give you advice on chess. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, both require immense amount of research and logic and critical thinking. So uh, I just read an article. I think it came out yesterday. Forbes uh, published an article about cybersecurity attacks are surging. All types are surging. They cited a Forrester report. That said, 74% of global companies in all industries, regardless of size, from massive companies to smaller companies, experienced uh, cyber breach last year. And that was up from 59% in 2020. So massive increase, 59 to 74. Now, in the article, because Forbes wanted to find out what companies are doing in terms of best job locking down their information and networks, for the first time, they produced uh, America's most cyber secure companies and they did that with partnership with you and your company so um uh security scorecard so can you tell us about the process of identifying 200 of the most cyber secure companies i'm proud that my company was in the upper half of the list so that's upper quartile of the list so talk to us about this list and how long it took and what's the process how do you rank these companies Sure. So indeed, uh, in collaboration with Forbes, Security Scorecard uh, published top 200 most cybersecure companies in America. So we collaborated on this work for months. And there were uh, a number of guidelines and objective principles that we undertook. So we look at the presence of uh, board directors with the cybersecurity expertise in a company's boards. We looked at... Uh, the presence and longevity of a CISO in those companies. We looked at indicators that the company has not had any type of breach disclosure. Uh, and then we applied fair and objective methodology that Security Scorecard developed, and it could be obtained at trust.securityscorecard.com. It's all publicly and publicly available, where we look at indicators of resilience from outside. And we look at hygiene. We look at how many cases does the company fetch its systems fast enough, 
Do you have any indications of a malware infestation within mm. the company? And we collaborated with uh, Forbes. It was completely objective. Sure. It didn't have to do anything with uh, any type of business relationship with us. We looked at every company out there uh, and uh, we saw which companies are trending in the right direction. Who are reacting very quickly when the incidents take place? Mm -hmm. Who really invest into cybersecurity in terms of how many people are employed by those companies doing cybersecurity? And that really resulted in this top uh, 200 list. Um, and obviously security is dynamic. It requires constant attention, proactiveness and investment. And we believe that those companies exemplified those best uh, qualities and characteristics. Any surprises with your findings in terms of uh, which industries uh, represented the bulk of the 200 companies? Uh, you, you may assume it's financial, but I don't know. I didn't look at the breakdown to map whether they're tech companies, retail companies, banking, um, and also surprises when without naming names that were well, they absentee names, again, without naming them, were there names that you thought would make the list but didn't make the list? Well, in terms of industry, uh, Vala, kind of like you mentioned, uh, it was not a surprise that financial services had stronger yeah. security posture sure. because big banks have a lot of money to invest. Sure. You know, they have large teams, they have large uh, resources that a lot of other companies don't have. So a lot of the time their security is really top notch. And some of the industries that may not have fared as well were uh, industries in the legal and the education sector. So, you know, if you really want to hack somebody, go hack the lawyer first. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think legal and, legal and education sector definitely have room to grow. Uh, in terms of surprises... The I wish I could go back and hack my grades to all straight A's. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of surprises, look, I think security has always been a subjective type of a feeling. That's the problem mm -hmm. with cybersecurity. Because the things that people think are safe, yeah. Uh, yeah. like, for example, uh, you know, I used to compete in chess after college, and I would go to this local coffee shop in New York b before smoking was prohibited, and I would be in this tiny room surrounded by fumes of smoke playing chess and uh, drinking coffee. And in hindsight, it probably wasn't very smart, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, I might get nervous if I'm on a plane and there's a turbulence, but statistically, it's totally safe. Well, the same in cybersecurity, the things that people worry about a lot of the time are safe. And the things that people think are safe are actually troublesome. And that's part of a reason why actually the mission of what we do was to introduce KPIs into how we measure and quantify risk. Once you have KPIs, not everybody may agree with them, sure. uh, but at least now you can improve what you can measure. So, uh, so yes, there were some surprises. There were some companies where we thought, okay, they should really make the list. But when we looked at statistic objective, objective indicators, we saw lots of uh, poor indications that would be to the contrary. Wow, fascinating. fascinating. Hey, so that's that's actually very interesting, right? So your your list actually includes public and private companies that are on that. Um, if you're a private company, do you have to worry about these SEC regulations? Do you have to do anything about it because they're not necessarily in the system? Or are they subject to the same level of scrutiny going forward because the, the SEC rules? Well, look, to the best of my knowledge, uh, at the moment, it's for public companies, right? To the best of my knowledge, at the moment, it's for public companies. Yeah. But I would say that um, if a company has to wait for regulations to worry about security, they're already in trouble uh, mm -hmm. because uh, compliance regulations and cybersecurity, you can think of it as overlapping concentric circles. If you're fully compliant, doesn't mean you're fully secure. And if you're fully secure, it doesn't mean you're compliant. But somewhere in between, exactly. somewhere in between, exactly. there's an intersection. But again, private companies need to be ahead of it because at this point, the hackers are looking for the easiest target. They're not sitting and thinking, is it a public company? Is it a private company? What's yeah, the requirement? They don't care. They're just looking for an easiest target to profit from. So, Alex, knowing that this uh, life time journey that you've been on is, is exactly that, a journey, it's being, it's not a destination. It's ongoing threat analysis and improvement and resiliency. So as a former CISO, what, what, how do you, how do you, what advice do you have to security and, and CISOs in terms of how they measure their performance, uh, knowing this is ongoing and, you know, you're, you're never threat free unless you're like an obsolete entity and nobody cares about you. <laughs> so what advice <laughs> do you have for CISOs that 
frankly, have awesome amount of responsibility on their shoulders because we've seen in the news, if uh, your company is exposed, not only it's a board level discussion, but your CEO may not be able to stay as CEO, depending on the severity of the, of the, of the, of the breach. No, the CISO job today is an incredibly stressful job yeah. because um, you've been asked to do more with less. The resources are being constrained and you have to save budget. On top of it, information is being digitized. Yeah. So there's a digitization proliferation of data so that introduces more doors for an attacker to open an attack. Um, and then uh, thirdly, you're being bombarded by thousands of security vendors who are trying to sell to you a solution and you don't even know what solution is going to work. Uh, so my advice for the CISOs is number one, you need to be able to communicate in the language of the boards. A lot of the time, security leaders use technical terms, but they don't explain to the board what the real risk is, what the financial impact is. So they need to get better to communicate in business terms. They need to position themselves as an enabler of strategic transformation, not as somebody who always says no. A lot of CISOs have a negative perception <laughs> as a cost center, somebody who does not get a seat at the, at the table with the adults. And thirdly, uh, you are no person. You just tell people you can't do it. Instead, position yourself as somebody who enables the boards to conduct more business, enables the boards to earn the trust and credibility of your customers and thereby drive more revenue. Uh, that's advice number one. Uh, advice number two is what you can't measure, you can't improve. Mm -hmm. You have to have a set of objective KPIs that you measure and quantify risk so that you can show to the board along with your plan and also show to them how's the industry doing, how your competitors doing and how you doing. Uh, and then um, thirdly, as a CISO, you have to be proactive instead of reactive. If you're just mm -hmm. sitting and waiting to be attacked, um, you're in a defensive position. Instead, shift the mindset. How do you assume that the adversary already got into the environment and you build a system to be as resilient as possible? Great advice. You know, Alex, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, we couldn't get on the show without talking about AI. Uh, it's been one of the top topics almost everywhere. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you guys are incorporating AI in terms of what you're doing. I noticed you guys were doing something with OpenAI and of course, ChatGPT. Uh, how does it impact, for example, security? Are AI bots fighting AI bots at, at this point in time? And more importantly for you guys, how are you using to improve um, your ability to address areas like threat intelligence, attack surfaces, and of course, right, vendor detection and things like that? Sure. Well, whenever there's a hype in a particular technology, you always have to be careful about talking about it, right? We had a hype with cryptocurrency and blockchain, then now there's a hype with generative AI. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of noise. But, um, you know, the power of generative AI, the power of those large language models, is that they enable you to take huge sets of data and to really explain those data sets and give you insights in human readable form. So for yep. example, we're sitting in a lot, a lot of data. We're collecting data about the resilience of 12 million companies over the past nine years. We layered a GPT layer on top of our data set, which enables the user to ask in human language, how am I doing against my competitors? What are the threats that are common in the financial services sector in Brazil? I'm located in hmm. one, what should I worry about? So I think the power of AI, you know, the power of generative uh, kind of models is that you can, we have too much data. Before we used to have no data. Now we're drowning in data and we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so using this technology, now you can reduce all these mountains of data into a, one or two actionable things that you need to pay attention to. It also comes with a risk. And the risk is um, in a generative AI, you get an output that looks kind of correct, yeah. but you don't really fully know if it's correct or not. It might be correct 99% of the time, but in the 1% that it's wrong, how do you avoid those mistakes? How do you avoid yeah. biases? Because at some point, all these data sets are always human trained. There's a human who provides a feedback loop as it's being trained. And yeah. it's known that those data sets end up containing biases. So, I mean, I think just like there's opportunity to reduce mountains of data, Sure. Do one or two actionable things and make faster decisions. There's also plenty of new risks that got introduced as well. 
Makes wow. sense. This is fascinating. We are learning so much about what's going on. And of course, you guys are on top of all this. We're here with Alex Yampolsky, CEO of Security Scorecard. And you can follow him on Twitter at A-Y-A-M-P-O-L-S-K-I-Y on Twitter. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thanks, Thank Ray. Thanks, Wallo. Thank you, Alex. Great to be with you all. Great. You're terrific. Wow. Uh, CISOs definitely have a lot on their shoulders. Um, Kind of a thankless job, if you ask me, <laughs> but but <laughs> one that's critically important. Okay, our next guest we have Dr. Anastasia Volkova, CEO and co-founder co -founder of Regrow, an award-winning company that empowers climate action through regenerative agriculture. Regrow, Ray, Regrow was named one of Fast Company's fifty most innovative companies yeah. this year, and number one most innovative company in agriculture. That. That's awesome. <laughs> Anastasia is recognized thought leader and innovator in regenerative ar uh, agriculture and sustainable food sourcing and has more than 10 years of experience in academia, business, and startups. She must have started when she was five. Anastasia has nurtured Regrow into a global company that empowers some of the world's largest brands to reduce GHG emissions across their supply chains and combat climate change through food production. Anastasia is a member of the Forbes Technology Council, a TEDx speaker, MIT's 35 under 35 innovators, BBC's top 100 women, one of the top 100 Australian innovators. And most recently, Anastasia was named Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst. I had to cut your bio short. We only have 20 minutes. I'm sorry. Welcome, Anastasia, to Disrupt TV. Thank you for having me. You made me blush. I don't know if you can see it, but I can feel it. <laughs> You're awesome. You haven't even answered any of our questions, and we already know you're awesome. Okay, go ahead. Ray. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good now. Hey, it's been great having you on the show. I'm not just kidding. Um, so, drop the you know, mic. You're, you're, <laughs> so you're you're in a, actually one of the hottest categories. I'm actually here in Taipei, Taiwan, definitely in ag tech capital. Uh, I've been spending some time talking to folks about what's going on with uh, you know regenerative farming uh, and other areas. But let's let's take some basics for our audience and help them understand and frame the questions and frame the understanding of like really what's at stake here. What, what are these foundational elements? Um, what needs to be put in place to support regenerative farming? And especially from a capital technology and skills point of view, because I don't think everybody fully understands what that is. And more importantly, I think it's important to help them understand why that is so important. 100% free. Uh, and let's just start with real basics of what is not quite right with agriculture right now that we need to change anything in the first place. So the way that we can think about it is looking at the UN FAO reports, we can see that agriculture and food industry contributes about 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This can be quite a counterintuitive because agriculture, of course, is the industry that is stewarding the land, producing the food. So we would um, really wish for it to be uh, synergistic with the environment rather than be in a place where it might be in a little bit of a vicious cycle where the climate is impacting agriculture. So think about drought or floods that are preventing, say, uh, water access, even recent fires uh, that we're uh, subjected to in some places in the world are constantly subjected to. They take out the water out of agriculture, but also agriculture itself in the morning, modern farming practices are optimized for productivity. Whilst we live in a mm. modern world and we've learned to understand the environmental impact of those practices as well. So we've realized that we need to go back to more wholesome practices incentivize them most importantly and so we refer to them as regenerative agriculture or climate smart farming and right you asked what needs to be in place for us to transition to that well yeah. a number of components of course but starting with you can't manage what you can't measure so first of all we need to understand where the emissions coming from, where the practices that are not necessarily contributing to resilience of the food production are happening in the landscape. So if we uh, unveil the globe in front of ourselves one day and we saw every field on planet Earth, which regrows on the journey, we're at 1.2 billion acres, so towards all of arable land, but we're making, making a dent. Um, if we were able to see that clearly, what are the practices, what are the outcomes, then that becomes measurable. Companies can say, this is where my supply ship, this is where I source from, this is where it is. And the next foundational element is incentives, because no one's going to change in the world in which fertilizer prices are through the roof, the risks are very high, there's disruptions of supply chain uh, because of COVID, 
because of climate um, change impacts like fires, um, like droughts and floods. So we're definitely in a place where um, we need to have clarity on the data side of the house. What are we doing? Where are we focusing? What's not working? Uh, good incentives and hopefully collaboration across the industry because it's not something that one company can care about and another company doesn't have to take care uh, about. We're all in the um, integrated web of agriculture food uh, production. Yeah, it's it's amazing that, you know, like this year, I believe we crossed 8 billion people on our planet. Projections are going to be 10 billion people in the next 20, 30 years. So more mouths to feed, more, we have to be more productive. We have to think about shared success. Um, and, and, and so this philosophy of farming and ranching and in harmony with nature makes sense. Um, so can you give us some examples of whether it's technologies, you mentioned data, um, innovations, uh, and, and some best practices from farmers around the world who have adopted this philosophy and approach. And, um, and, and as you describe these innovations and technologies, can you also shed some light in terms of how are they reskilling themselves? How, what does a farmer need to do to adopt this, this regenerative framework? Great question, Bella. Um, on one hand, we are operating agriculture and food in a very complex supply chain. So you may not know, I mean, obviously, Ukrainian conflict is a good example. A lot of the wheat and yeah. sunflower was coming from Ukraine. Then that was shut off. A grain export corridor was shut off. We had to readjust and rebalance. And so you almost can think about the world uh, as a connected system of uh, vessels. Like we're producing here, we're producing over there. Mm -hmm. How can we balance um, our demand and supply in this um, global uh, industry? And so information definitely helps us with that. But I also want to emphasize that there has been a number of groups of farmers that have been very, um, I guess, farming in areas that are susceptible uh, to these climate change effects. And they've actually been very forward looking and adopting some of these climate smart practices. So we can see on some farms what decades of these practices really do and what wow. level of resilience they lead to. So in terms of how we unveil that, it's through the combination of science and technology. It's by using, for example, satellite imagery to monitor the farming practices, both on, on any type of area of the land. So is it a cropping uh, farm? Is it a ranch? Really seeing the crop rotations, the diversity, uh, the, the health of that uh, crop and productivity. Um, and farmers get access to the other side of that technology, so to speak, the ability for them to uh, enter into a so-called MRV or Monitor and Measurement Reporting Verification System, where they can provide a little bit of the data about their farm, see what data is available from both public systems and these satellite-based systems, confirm, and get effectively the payment from one of their buyer partners to change the practices. And the payment is not for a bushel of corn or soy or for a ton of wheat. The payment is for a ton of carbon or for environmental services that it provides around water quality, biodiversity. So we're really starting to value nature capital and science and technology plays a key unlocking role because we don't have to ask every farmer quite or everything that they've done to get to a pretty good estimate that we're trending in the right direction. What should we change? Yeah. And which countries are decades ahead? Is, are they, are they, uh, you know, uh, particular regions around the earth where they've adopted this framework and, and they're leading the world in terms of regenerative agriculture? That's a fantastic question. And that's exactly what, what Regrow does, right? Like we monitor these areas to see the practices and outcomes. And so, as I mentioned, some countries say, like Canada, uh, I know with the fire season right now, it's a bit challenging sure, sure, to, to believe, sure. but um, Canada, of course, is in a, a challenging climatic position, uh, as is Australia, um, as are parts of uh, Europe. Uh, or Middle East. And so countries that are uh, water constrained and have historically experienced a lot of challenges around accessing the natural resources, they're very savvy in their farming practices because their livelihood literally 
depend sure. on the ability to retain, say, water on their farm. So I would cite those com- countries as examples. I can't say we're decades ahead because our industry generally only has seven harvests until 2030. And 2030 is a very important time stamp where we need to get on the right trajectory, which is not beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. Right. Right. Currently, we're not quite trending in line with that trajectory so we want to make sure we don't overshoot and then have to correct having you know lost some species having seen catastrophic floods and things like that sure sure. yeah you know the the model that you're talking about for paying for carbon output is actually very interesting right that's that's a model that is is designed to create market-based approaches and incentives that are there tell us a little bit about what cargo and kellogg's have been doing in the space as they've been some companies that have been taking advantage of some of the work that you've been doing and partnering with you along the way so yes um i am a very privilege to to share that those are our customers and partners and i will try to do my best to do the justice to our joint work um, but of course there's a lot more work that they're doing in the space so let's look at those two examples one cargill not everyone may know that company but they move probably around the quarter of the world's agricultural production around the world by buying it from farmers and selling it to um food companies that whose logos we see on the supermarket shelves and um Cargill has realized that not only it's important to buy the commodity from the farmer to pay them for corn, wheat, soy, uh, sunflowers, etc., but also to recognize the value of the environmental stewardship associated with the production of that commodity. And they um, have been one of the pioneers of the approach of actually contracting with farmers and paying them partly forward, partly as the practices get implemented for these ecosystem benefits, for the tons of carbon that are, say, sequestered in the soil by plants or not even uh, emitted in the first place, or so-called abated, um, and the other uh, co-benefits on the farm. So you can imagine Cargill with its global reach into farming network is offering farmers the opportunity to transition to regenerative agriculture practices and bring those differentiated products and offers to their demand customers, the food brands that we know so well by like Kellogg's and others. I was just with General Mills yesterday at a conference and amazing to see a 150 year old company who has digitized so much of their processes and they're so data driven understanding every intricacies of the supply chain and understanding consumer behavior and delivering personalized services you know as mm. a, you know i consider you know i'm a digital immigrant i wasn't born mobile social cloud i have a 13 year old son who's a digital native so it was amazing to see general mills you know a 50 billion market cap company who's you know digital immigrant they weren't born in the cloud and mobile and social but they're one of the most advanced companies when it comes to using data can you talk to us in terms of the importance of, and you mentioned data, the data marketplace and how you can manage more greener initiatives and your carbon footprint by leveraging data. What what advice do you have? How can companies begin on that journey of using data to make well-informed decisions to ensure our planet is at a better place uh, before 2030, where we're trying to get to these uh, temperature goals? Absolutely. And well, I will unpack it just based on those examples of General Mills and Kellogg, who are our, our customers. So one thing you can do is approach it from a product perspective. So you may look at your portfolio and you say, OK, we're producing special keys and Rice Krispies. Of course, rice is a major commodity we're sourcing. We have good visibility into where that commodity comes from. We should then go and partner with those who we source this commodity from, with partners, with their millers, uh, with those that bring that rice into the mill and uh, give them the software, the enablement, the budget to effectively risk share for them to adopt these practices. And the beauty that comes from that is that now you have grown more climate smart rice that is in your supply chain that you put um, into production of those iconic brand products and you take it to a supermarket shelf. Like that is a very um, vertical 
centric specific way to start you're taking the brand you understand the supply chain you enable it you create a use case and back to you were talking about of course risk and resilience those are exactly the words that we operate with you create that use case in the business unit you bring it to chief sustainability officer usually they're involved throughout but maybe you bring that to the chief financial officer and you show them this is what we could do this could reduce this amount of emissions. Um, I will also give you an example of General Mills that approached it from a different perspective, um, but also complementary, uh, as they also invest on farms. But uh, interestingly, they adopted Regrow technology on their global supply footprint on 170 million acres, and they're observing uh, what practices are um, adopted, how much of uh, the farmland is um, stewarded in the regenerative fashion, what are the emissions associated with that, and they are able to then incorporate that data into the plan. Not only they're seeing what's happening, but recurrent data also helps them understand what's possible. Scenario planning for if you were to invest into regenerative agriculture this much, what percentage of your impact gap between your current emission levels, which is a bit higher mm. than it should be, and your goal target emissions levels, how do you close that impact gap? That's, awesome. That's what the science and technology can tell you. Anastasia, please keep making sure General Mills is successful. I love my haagen I love my Wheaties, I love my Cheerios. So <laughs> as I look at my kitchen cabinet, I realize, wow, I, I'm a pretty pretty great customer of General Mills. So anyway, keep doing what you're doing. Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is it's really important. But actually, one of the interesting things you're touching upon is the fact that we've got new classes of data right these brand new classes of data are, are really changing the way we actually connect and and these are future data marketplaces built on not just net zero information but a whole bunch of other factors as you said earlier at the beginning of the show right you can't really do much until you measure something and what you're doing at this moment is you're actually at the point of actually creating a marketplace of data information and insights that could actually create a new asset class of companies tell us more about this how do you envision that future data market marketplace uh, built starting with net zero information and potentially expanding that to other areas. We believe this information should be accessible to companies in the uh, public sector, private sector, but also to general public. So we offer a lot of this information at the aggregate scale so that it's de-identified and you cannot really see what individual say, farmers are doing. Um, so that's by definition protected. In being able to expose this information, you can inform decisions at a great scale. Um, right to your question, the types of things you can enable, it's not just the upcoming SEC climate disclosure requirements to be met, um, but also yeah. uh, to <laughs> those important ones uh, coming at the end of the month. We will hear more about that. I don't them. know, scope yeah. two, three, maybe four. We'll create four. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, hopefully they will only mandate the scope one and two because scope three where we work is very challenging, but yeah. there's clearly yeah. up and coming solutions that you cannot refer to it as a black box anymore. There is data for yeah. it. There is ability to make decisions around it. So the asset classes in the different companies, right, as you mentioned, you can create now uh, a differentiated, say, carbon neutral um, cereal flake because of you know how you've grown it, you've known how you optimize the landscape. Um, and that foundationally is differentiated if you want to bring it to consumers. Gen Zs are responding uh, so much uh, better to uh, sustainably marketed brands. Sustainably marketed brands in general are growing two digits as opposed to traditional brand single digit growth. So we're seeing all of the right pushes and pulls to create that data transparency and give unprecedented level of visibility so we can really take ownership and solve this problem. My final question to you, I mean, all of this makes sense. Like, I, you know, it's, I don't understand how philosophically you could debate your vision and Regrow's uh, mission. Um, so so <laughs> what, what, what's the biggest obstacle that Regrow or, or, or our society will face in terms of adopting regenerative agriculture? Is it reskilling, retooling, knowledge transfer? Mm. Is it just, hey, this is the way we've done it. This is the way my grandfather did it and his grandfather, you know. What's the biggest obstacle in adopting what seems to be pretty, pretty great evidence-based approach of doing be better? 
Love your words, Val. I'll definitely make sure that uh, all of our team partners and customers hear that. Uh, um, I appreciate it. Um, I would say um, it's unreasonable to think that farmers do not want resilience on their farm and in their community. Of course they do, but I think how we structured incentives is a critical point. So as Greta Thunberg always says, we already know the solutions. We already have them. We already know the answers. We just need to act and act now. And in agriculture and food, acting does mean redistributing the incentives, deciding where they are that they need to be redirected towards these practices. And now we have the evidence-based approach to funnel that incentive towards the outcome that we now see as more important than productivity mm -hmm. alone. It's the profit with purpose logic. It's the productivity with resilience yeah. outcome. That's exactly the same. I love it. Wow. This has, been, this has been fascinating. Amazing to see what's going on here. We're here with Dr. Anastasia Valkova, co-founder and CEO of Regrow. And of course, you can find out all the cool things that they've been doing, uh, as well as their funding rounds, their Series B company, Galvanized led the round, and more importantly, seeing the good work that they're doing on Regrow. So thanks a lot. So and thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Anastasia. You're awesome. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Thank you. What a big, bold space. Uh, and and if you envision our planet as an important stakeholder, this is, this is really important work. Um, so, okay. Uh, our final guest, this is what we call like the cleanup hitter spot where a guest comes and hits a grand slam and just expands our minds. So with that, we have Adam Bryant, author of The Leap to Leader, How Ambitious Managers Make the Jump to Leadership. I needed this book early in my career. Adam's a senior managing director and partner at the Axo Group where he works with hundreds of senior leaders and high potential executives. As creator and former author of the iconic corner office column in New York Times, Adam has mastered the art of distilling real world lessons from hundreds of interviews and turning them into practical tools, presentations, and exercises to help companies deepen their leadership bench and strengthen their teams. Adam also worked with executive leadership teams to help drive their transformation strategies based on a best practice framework he developed for his wildly praised book, The CEO Test, Mastering the Challenge That Make or Break All Leaders. You can follow Adam on Twitter. He must have been an early adopter because it's his name. Adam B. Bryant, two Bs in there. Adam B. Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T. Welcome, Adam, to the Shrap TV. Great. Thanks for having me, guys. Great. Hey, we're super excited to have you. And I've been reading that column for a very long time. And uh, it was really excited to see you pull a lot of those concepts and new concepts into this book. But let's start with the central paradox of leaders, right? And this book comes out in July. So we're getting the ultimate preview here. Um, so selfless versus self-centered. What is that paradox? Because it comes up almost every time we talk about that concept of leadership. Sure. And there's a couple of ways to come at this. I think the first insight, and it's hard for a lot of leaders to get their brain around, is that it is about you at some level. Like as the leader of a company, you set the tone, you set the energy, you are overread, people are studying you, um, and you get a lot of credit for stuff you did and, and also didn't do. And so it's very easy for that, that just that life, people to go to their heads and so the paradox, it, it is about you. You need to recognize it and acknowledge that. But ultimately, leadership is not about you, right? It's about the organization. It's about elevating the people around you, developing their talents. So it is that sort of weird balance point. And it's not an or construct. It, it has to be an and construct. You have to do both. So when I started uh, as a manager, uh, you know, I recall reading Tom Peters, uh, Jim Collins, Ken Blanchard, Seth Godin. My favorite book of all time is Clay Christensen, How to Measure Your Life, which was later in my career. But I, I read all these leadership books, but I didn't have my own leadership user manual. Right. Why is that important? What is it and why is it important? Yeah, it's super easy to explain, and it grew organically out of uh, out of the interviews that I've done. But if you just imagine for a second that you know I joined your team, right, as as a colleague, maybe we'd met each other a couple of interviews, but suddenly we're working together every day. So what do we know for certain? We know for certain it's going to take us three to six months to figure each other out, mm -hmm. right? Because newsflash, we're all human beings, therefore we all have our quirks, we've got our pet peeves, we got our gold stars introverts, extroverts, some people prefer email versus phone calls, um, all these different sort of work style preferences. 
And so yeah. the whole point of the user manual is on the first day of, again, let's say I joined you guys, your team. On that first day, we said, like, what should I know about you? Like, how do you like to work? What are your preferences? And, and that's a, a two-way street conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and we just get all that stuff out on the table. And, and it's not about memorizing each other's Myers-Briggs or anything like that. It's just like, <laughs> you know, like, who are you? And, and like, what drives you nuts? What do you love? Like, how do you like to communicate? How do you like to give and get feedback? And once I had this insight, um, and it was first shared with me by the CEO uh, that I mentioned in the book, Evar Progrud. Um, but over time, and, and it's interesting, you guys have passed the thousand interview milestone, and, and so have I in all my interviews with CEOs wow. and other senior leaders. Awesome. So you do get this database. But I, I just noticed a lot of leaders sharing with me that they were quite explicit and quite upfront with their teams about, like, this is what you should know about me. And the whole point, the spirit of the user manual is not one of arrogance. It's not like I'm sitting in my king's throne and you've got to peel the grapes before I eat them. It's not that, right? It's <laughs> we're all we're all human beings. And you know, it's just one example. One CEO said to his entire team, if you send me an email and I have to scroll on my iPhone to read it, I'm not gonna read it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's, and to yeah. me, in, in the spirit of that, like it's good information. It's something that you'd rather know about. Absolutely. A colleague than not know about them. And Absolutely. another CEO would tell people like, look, you're presenting to me for the first time. I just want you to know up front. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And it's yeah. because I'm interested. So just so you know, because otherwise, when she was doing that, she realized people think I'm interrogating them. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like oh, putting up yeah. a billboard on the highway about your leadership style. I love that. I love the um, removing blind spots, removing misread cues. Like, is it an interrogation or are they really interested in what I have to say? So I think that is there a second or third edition of the user manual? Do, do you find with your interviews, folks that had a user manual over time, added chapters, deleted chapters? Like, yeah, it's not yeah. a fixed Exactly. And it, yeah. it's not something that, you, you know, you chisel into a tablet yeah. um, and, and it's done, right? Like we, we evolve as human beings and it can be updated. You might change a little bit, evolve, move into different positions. But, you know, at the core of it is just this simple idea. It's like we're all human beings, like we are it. all have our quirks and stuff. So just like in our own dysfunctional extended families, right? Like we got, oh, Uncle Joe, you got to like, you know, make sure yeah. he gets his coffee this way, right? <laughs> like we can accommodate each other as human beings. And I just think like going into that, um, going into work with that kind of mindset, because uh, I often reflect on the fact that like in business, there's this sort of myth that it's like you can take 10 strangers, put them together on a team and say, boom, you're a team. You're a high performing <laughs> team, like go. It's just not going to happen. Nope. nope. Right. And if you can sort of figure each other out and connect as a human level, that builds trust. And then you can just move much faster as a team because that's the point of the user manual. It's like, let's figure each other out so we don't have to spend time figuring each other out. Right. We can focus on the work rather than like, you frown a lot when I talk. Is that just like resting processing face or is that like you got a problem with what I'm saying, right? I like that. It makes I total sense. How, it makes total I sense. I love how explicit it is. And that's, that's really important, especially coming here in Cal where I'm in California normally. It's like super passive aggressive. Nobody says anything and right. there's it's nothing's explicit and, and, and listed out there. I mean, otherwise, it's like ENTJ versus ISFP cage match, right? I mean, I'd be like, what the heck's going on here? So Yeah, and I've been interviewed yeah. CEOs who, you know, they told me they use Myers-Briggs and I'll say, I'm curious, what are you? And they'll go, INTJ. And I said, remind me what those letters stand for. They don't even know. Yeah. They don't right? even know. I, don't even exactly. Know letters. How are you supposed to remember somebody else's? Yeah. yeah. Where if somebody <laughs> says, like, I really don't like people interrupting me, it's like, I'll probably remember that about you. you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's good to have that. And, and one of the things that you talk about is really, um, there's a lot of talk. Talk is cheap, right? And uh, one of the things that you're talking about is how do you improve the do to say ratio? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think that's actually pretty interesting to, to observe as well. Talk about what it is and uh, why it's important. Sure. So credit for that expression goes to a guy named Brett Wilson, who's a CEO in the Valley. Um, and what it means is just like what percentage of the things that you say you're going to do, do you actually do? Like day to day, week to week, month to month, what is your cruising speed do to say ratio? 
And to me, it's so important. I, and when you when you get that insight, I always ask people, like, think of kind of everybody you've worked with in your career, just broadly speaking. You could put them on a spectrum, right? Like at one end, you got those people you, who say to you, yeah, I'll get that to you Thursday morning. And you don't even have to think about it because you know it's going to be there, right? They're yep. just reliable, dependable. They always do what they say that they're going to do. And then there's people at the other extreme, they go, I'll get you that report on Thursday. And you go, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. Nah, it's like a half. They're going to show up and it's Thursday. You go, hey, remember that thing you said you were going to do? Oh, yeah, I'll get it to you Monday. And you go, no, you're not. Right. What was that phrase from Brett? It was, it's all in the follow through. That's what right. it was. It's yeah. all in the follow through. Right. Tube and, mogul. That's it. That's it. And, and when, so. when I, uh, when I was a manager myself for 14 years, you know, I, was, I probably should have been explicit about this, but I'm realizing this in hindsight. Like when you're a manager, if I have to keep your to do list on my to do list, like that mm. is a, not a good use. Not of happening. Not a good use of my brain space, right? I like that. I, I, I uh, uh, this Monday I had, I had, I had lunch with Tom Peters, and at one point he said, "You know, Vala, it's, it's all in the last two percent. Like uh, that Thursday morning report that's due, like yeah. delivering it on Thursday. You know, all the stuff you did before the that deadline. You know, it's all in the two percent." But it takes a certain level of awareness to realize, recognize where you are in that spectrum. If you if you have a reputation of not being reliable, or uh, you know you're reliable, but you're, you have issues with competency or integrity or benevolence, whatever the components are that help you earn trust with your peers. And I don't know how you can be, be a leader without earning trust. Right. How do you build that self awareness muscle that says, you know what, I'm not as reliable as I need to be, and I need to do something about that. Yeah. Um, before you get, you know, the Manila envelope and you're shown the door, like how do you build that self-awareness muscle before it's too late? Yeah. The, the, the first point is to realize it is important because let's face it. A lot of people, I don't think they think it is that important because mm. they don't have a good do to say ratio. Right. Nope. And so I, I've just found like, you know, I'm older than you guys. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, I am. Um, and, you know, you, you live long enough and you realize like there's not a lot of people who are really good at always following through. Right. True. And those no. people who do True. you trust them, they're just gold. Right. They're reliable, they're dependable. Yep. So, you know, that's why the, the, the subtitle of the book is how ambitious managers make the jump to leadership, because if you are ambitious, part of your goal is to say, well, how do I set myself apart? And you guys know this, right? The simplest stuff, the most basic stuff, if you do it, you will set yourself apart because a lot of people don't do it. So the first point is to recognize this is important. And if I'm not good at it, how do I get better at it? And I always say, this is a very easy hack. Every time you say you're going to do something, just write it down on your phone, on your computer, on a piece of paper, in a notebook. And if you were just, if you just develop that discipline, you will build your reputation as being reliable, which builds trust, and then people want you on their team. Is the writing it down uh, uh, simply a prompt that reminds you that you've made a promise? Uh, it, is it the practice of writing down? And I know studies have shown writing things down could be seven, eight X retention, but what is the writing down? Is, and is it writing down and sharing so you've not only, not as evidence of your promise, so you have some sort of catalyst that says, get off the couch, you have to write the report and get it to, you know, Adam by Thursday morning. Uh, why is that important, the writing piece? I, you know, you're asking big cosmic questions to me. <laughs> it, it's like super tactical. It works. Time. It works. Yeah, it just and, works. And I've been keeping lists for my entire career. And it's the me only too. way, like the way I operate too, is like, I don't want useless, not useless stuff, but unimportant yeah. stuff floating around in my brain, right? Like This it's is not just good, full of lists, right? literally my notebook, uh, exactly. and it's analog. I actually yeah. write it analog. <laughs> right, and if, if you can get that, just the tactical stuff out of your brain, it feels like it frees up more RAM to yeah. think about stuff that matters. So that's why I do it, and it's just a way of like, you know, you build your reputation as being reliable, and Absolutely. it's just really important. Like, people need to know that when you say you're going to do something, you're yeah. going to do it. Yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Talk Ray, about. You let's yeah. definitely. You're. On, you're. I'm sorry. You're on yeah, mute. not hearing you. Oh, sorry about that. Now. Let's definitely talk about networking and uh, networking in terms of without networking. How do you network without networking? That's a well, very well, very interesting challenge, as as people have found out. And uh, what does that mean too? Yeah, I, I, part of it. Um, 
you know, in, in writing this, in some ways I was writing it for myself because um, I'm an introvert, right? And, you know, the sort of third circle of hell for me, if somebody says like, there's 30 people over there in a cocktail <laughs> hour before a conference, just go mingle with them. Like I'm more comfortable on a stage in front of 5,000 people than I am having to make small talk with a bunch of strangers. Sure. Um, and I also have found, you know, a lot of people just feel like networking is really transactional. It's got this kind of icky. Um, and and so they just say, like, I don't do it. And and I always try and say, you need to reframe it and you need to build real relationships just in like you do in other parts of your life, right? And and to me, the the best way to network is to is to work with somebody on something, right? Inside companies, like I think it's it's a very different experience that if you reach out to a colleague, you say, Hey, you want to grab a coffee or like a drink after work, you have a good social call, like are you favorite football teams, all that other stuff. I think it's like a 10x better experience in terms of building that connective tissue with somebody. Yeah, to definitely. Raise your hand for some like ad hoc committee that the company is forming on innovation or whatever it is. Raise <laughs> your hand for that, right? Join it and then and then do something with people, yeah. right? Because then all those like key things, like how do you perform? Are you reliable? Are you trustworthy? Are you adding value? Are you asking good questions? Are you a good teammate? Like those uh, doing work with somebody, accomplishing, achieving something with somebody is going to really drive those roots down in the relationship. They're going to last much longer than, hey, man, that was a really good coffee we had the other day. Yeah. <laughs> I could have used you so oh my, in my career. I, I'm a terrible networker. I'm an introvert. I, I fight with imposter syndrome. If there's a group of 30, it's super taxing for me when I'm yeah. done engaging with them i'm shattered because it's yeah. so hard to be Real interesting i pretended to get fake phone calls like just so it's like somebody got to yeah can somebody pull the fire alarm so i can exactly. get out of here no exactly. but i love people i love learning it's just not i'm not wired to make that first yeah, you know, yeah. A ask or and i feel like i'm inconveniencing people so right. it's just it's just not and I, you know it's a struggle i continue right. I, and, and and as you said i can be on a stage in front of tens of thousands and to me it's less taxing than a 20 person uh conversation so over time though i've re like networking i think is about giving like the better the more of a giver you are versus exactly. a taker uh, the, the connections are stronger, long lasting. There's reciprocity, even though you shouldn't expect it. Like, you know, the, the fighting against, uh, you know, a sense of entitlement, I think is super important if you want to be an effective networker, I think. So yeah. everything you said makes perfect sense to me. I just wish I volunteered for these group projects, like you said, so there was a meaningful um, collaboration so you can demonstrate what you can add in terms of value and also learn about other people's strengths and yeah. capabilities. And, and and I also think just to build on your point, I mean, just as human beings, I think we're really wired to have really sensitive antenna for whether you're in it for yourself or whether you're in it for the organization or to help others. And, you know, like we just sense that about people. And I think with networking to your point, you like go into it, like, what can I do for you? How can I help you? You join a committee, inside the company and it's about like okay i want to help improve the culture here right if yeah. you don't make it about you all the opportunities are going to come to you because people want to work with helpful people absolutely and as someone who's interviewed a thousand people i know you're a giver because we do these <laughs> interviews so we can learn and share yeah uh and 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 uh to me teaching people to reach their full potential is the ultimate form of giving so yeah. thank you I, for all your interviews thank you no, for thank your you. incredible book uh many books and uh, really, you helped expand our mind. You did hit a grand slam as the last guest. So anyway, Ray, uh, your thoughts. <laughs> well, you know, no, this is this is amazing, and it's like the corner office just came to life to me here, and and that to me was pretty powerful. There's so much in your book. It comes out July 11th. Is that when it is? Exactly. Uh, in terms of the pub date, very very cool. So we're really looking forward to seeing that. Get the book, pre-order it now. July 11th, 2023 is when the book will get to you. We're here with Adam Bryant, author of The Leap to Leader, How Ambitious Managers Make the Jump to Leadership. Cross that chasm. And more importantly, you can follow him on Twitter at Adam B. Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank and you happy so much, Friday. Adam. I'm thanks, building guys. my user manual. I'm going right. to do that. I think that's great. Oh, yeah, I know. That's what I'm working on on the flight back. Ray, wait <laughs> till it. you read it. There's a lot of it about Disrupt TV. <laughs> <laughs> 
you don't worry, you don't have to peel grapes for me. But <laughs> uh, um, okay, wow. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Alex, uh, Dr. Anastasia, and and Adam, uh, summarize it for us, Ray, uh, in in sixty seconds, please. Oh my! It stumped the chump again. Welcome. <laughs> um, so here we go. Um, there's a lot going on, especially in cybersecurity, and and I think what was interesting is Security Scorecard is a very interesting company because what they're doing is they're aggregating all that information and insights about where companies are. But what we learned is really that these rules and regulations are coming fast and furious. And what our company is going to have to be doing is really being able to respond and being able to get ahead of what's important in cybersecurity. That takes a very different kind of leadership at the boardroom level. And I think organizations are starting to understand what that what it takes. I mean, it's always been a number one issue. Vala, you talk to all these CXOs and, you know, security is always top on the list, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that's, that's part of what's going on. Um, what we also learned about is there's also other leadership at a boardroom level. And that leadership's also happening in terms of how we look at um, the, the environment. What do we actually have to do to make that work? And once again, a lot of metrics, a lot of quant required to actually understand how we build these new systems that will incentivize better behavior, especially in the world of agriculture and in terms of food. Um, we learned through the Ukraine war, we learned through other systems uh, in terms of environmental impact where you know, droughts can impact population migration, can impact lives, right? And and this is one of the ways to get ahead of that pro problem. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Adam pretty much was talking about where leadership is going. And for managers trying to make leadership work, right, there is a lot to learn, right? You could be a high performer, but not be aware of what's going on. Yeah. And there's a lot of that, you know, self-awareness that's important to be there as, as you learn through those leadership pieces. And honestly, having read the corner office column for quite some time, it was really amazing to see, you know, how to get leadership or, or move from, you know, high performer to a leader and high performing leader. So I, I think for this episode, it was really about leadership uh, yeah. and, and in different, different ways. So what's absolutely. your take? No, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, what was interesting is Alex talking about what you think is important may not be as important. What you ignore could be absolutely your Achilles heel. Uh, Anastasia just impresses me because it's big, bold, um, problems it's a big idea it's a big yeah. idea yeah. it's a big idea yeah. and it impacts all demographics our geographies the entire population and um and it, it's going to require tremendous consensus building for people to do things differently especially when the incentives are not there for to yeah. motivate them to think even if they philosophically believe, believe that it's a better approach better for all it's a shared success model um yeah, it's hard. And uh, many people don't make the leap from manager to leader. Uh, you know, as you and I know, um, it takes a certain level of grit, persistence, dis discipline, optimism, humility, benevolence, integrity, reliability, oh, yeah. capability. A lot of ingredients that go into that delicious uh, slice of leadership cake. <laughs> and uh, you miss any one of those ingredients and it's not going to taste good. Um, and a little so, luck. And a little by luck. the way, this is some commentary about the importance of leadership over management. Every great company has a combination of management skills and leadership skills. And there are great managers who are also leaders. So this is not one or the other. You can't, you can't run a successful business with great, strong managers. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, uh, the middle managers, I think, the, are the most valuable players in any company uh, uh, that connect the doers and the thinkers and actually get shit done. Uh, so incredible episode. Uh, we have episode 326 next week. We have Michael Amori, CEO of Virtualytics. We have John Reed, my favorite, one of my favorite, I know one of our favorite guests, co-founder of Digenomica. John always brings his A-game and expands our minds. And Jason Del Rey, author of Winner, Sell All, Amazon, Walmart, and the Battle of Our Wallets. Battle of Our Wallets. You better add Apple to that as well. Uh, incredible. All right. Well, if it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you next Friday for episode... 326. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday.